And I literally am not sure what to make of it except to say that you're being asked to be comfortable with not knowing everything, not getting to the bottom of it and taking that sort of uncertainty and making it part of your experience. Hi, I'm Andrew Goldstein, and this is The Art Angle, a podcast from ArtNet News where the art world meets the real world, bringing each week's biggest story down to earth. Well, it's biennial season in a big biennial year. The Toronto Biennial just opened, the Venice Biennale opens next week, and around the corner are the German heavyweights, the Berlin Biennale, and Documenta, which is actually a quinquennial, but who's quibbling? This would be an exciting time in any year, but in 2022, it has the added dimension of being the first time that the world's art community will be able to get together with a ton of important new work in person after these past two pandemic years. Recently, Cecilia Alemani came on the Art Angle to talk about her Venice Biennale. Today's episode is dedicated to another biennial near and dear to our hearts that just opened earlier this month. Of course, I'm talking about the Whitney Biennial. Running through September 5th, the show is a signature offering of the Whitney Museum of American Art where it tries to live up to its full name by taking a snapshot of what the country's artists have been making, thinking about, and feeling recently. To talk about what this year's edition holds, I'm very happy to be joined by Artnet News Chief Art Critic Ben Davis, one of the top thinkers and feelers out there, who might be able to shed some light on this very ambitious, very interesting show. So thanks very much for coming back on The Art Angle, Ben. Yeah, great to be here and to think and to feel with you through this show. So... Let's start by talking about biennials as a phenomenon themselves. What do biennials mean to you? And does your heart go pitter-patter when you go walk into one? Somewhere between a uh, pitter-patter of excitement, like when you see someone you love for the first time in a long while, and a pitter-patter of dread. These are exciting events. If you write about art, if you like art, if you're an artist, biennials are kind of the centerpiece of the art calendar for you, where you get to see what your peers are doing, where you get to see what the new trends are, where you get to see how curators are thinking through the moment we live in. And the Whitney Biennial is in the United States. It's our big entry into this genre. And obviously, biennials are very complicated. It's full of lots of art. You have to take it in very quickly because you can't spend days there. You can spend hours, but yeah, you yeah. can't spend days. So we just published a great piece on Artnet News by Melissa Smith that everybody should check out, where she asked five curators how they approach viewing a biennial. So how do you do it? I think it helps to have a system to approach these things. First thing I do is I walk through the entire show, get a sense of the size of these things and what the highlights and big points, what the things you might want to spend more time are. And I think that's important because these are huge events and you can just get a lot of biennial fatigue. I put down a mental map of what it all is and then I go back and I look at every work in the show systematically and read every text. In the case of this biennial, it's very video heavy. So that meant seeing every film, which means I've been back to the Whitney five times. I've probably sat through about 20 hours of film. And so how many hours do you think you've logged in total taking in this biennial? Probably four solid days. Yeah. But who's counting? When you come in, the text you read on the fifth and sixth floors where the main part of the show is that introduces the show specifically begins with a reference to time it says that the show is a response to the sense of time stretching out and expanding during the pandemic the way time has felt kind of warped and i think it's worth people keeping that in mind when they go into this show because i think it is a biennial that maybe doesn't make a great impression on the first fly through, but does unfold over time. There's a lot of time-based work. There's a lot of work that asks you to spend time with it. And so how much you like this show is going to depend a little bit on how much time you have to put into it or how much time you care to put into it. And it makes sense that the curators would be thinking about time because this actually is a year late. They were originally planning this show three years ago before the pandemic, before the election, before the protests for racial justice across the country. So this has been a long time coming for them. And of course, we're not talking about any biennial. We're talking about the Whitney Biennial, which comes with its own specific kind of history, its own reputation. Its own baggage. Why is this show so important and what makes it so distinct? This is a biennial of, quote unquote, American art. So this has historically been the place where people sum up what's been going on. As time has gone on and 
people think more critically about identity, nationalism, and so on. The question of what it means to be an American artist, what it means to even be a contemporary artist has come into focus. So this show casts a little bit of a broader net, you know, bringing in artists who work in different places, including Mexico or our First Nation artists from Canada. There's an artist in this show who's very prominent in this show, who's in the process of becoming a citizen. So it's very self-consciously a show about what being an American might mean now, what it might mean to claim that identity, what the questions we should be asking about claiming that identity are. And you mentioned that the show has some baggage. You know, the Whitney Biennial is famously infamous. And I think that just as in Formula One racing, some people watch for the virtuosity of driving that you see in the tracks. Some people watch for the car crashes. And I think a lot of people might look at the Whitney Biennial and they wait to see what will be the big controversy this year. So why is that? I think there is a larger answer to that, which is that the Whitney Biennial matters a lot. Who is represented in the Whitney Biennial is a statement, self-consciously a statement about American art. So it inflames all these questions about who's in and who's out. And particularly in the last decade, there's been a lot of questions about how the art canon is formed, how institutions function. It's been one of the big places where the public conversation, the debates about identity, about race, about inclusion have manifested. So the last three editions have been very contentious for very different reasons. Questions of racial representation. The last biennial, there was major protests around a donor at the Whitney that made it into the show in the form of an artwork by Forensic Architecture, which sort of addressed the business practices of a board member of the Whitney who was a weapons dealer, essentially. The figures who are introduced at the Whitney Biennial have a shot at becoming part of the larger conversation in a longer term sort of way, but it makes itself a target. This year so far, um, things have been a little bit quiet. There is a campaign by the workers of the Whitney Biennial. There's labor action at the Whitney. They flyered the opening. I support the workers of the Whitney, and I think that that's in its way an important thing to keep in mind underneath all of this because it's a biennial that thematically very much has a lot of protest in it. So it is natural that people look at these progressive themes of the Whitney Biennial. It's only doing its work. If it asks the people who work there and those of us who go there how those things matter to us in our own lives. I went to the press preview and the director of the museum, Adam Weinberg, said something that has kind of stuck with me, which is that, you know, you always want to be part of the conversation. You just don't necessarily get to pick which conversation that is. And I think that we're still finding out what the conversation around this show is going to be. But let's talk about the show itself. What is this edition of the Whitney Biennial like? It's called Quiet As It's Kept. And it is a quiet and reverent biennial, I would say. It fits a larger pattern that I've noticed in every recent biennial that I've been to. On the third floor of the biennial, which is the education floor, is dedicated to something called Cassandra Press, which is an initiative of Candace Williams and spotlights black cultural production. And it's something I've really noticed in the last number of biennials. They tend to include within them some sort of pedagogical project about black cultural production reframed as an artwork or incorporated into the artistic programming. And I think that that says something about the way biennials are expected to work right now. You should expect to be educated when you go into them. They assume a viewer who's not just there to take some photos. They don't assume a viewer that's kind of like an esthete looking for beauty. Necessarily, they assume people who are looking to be informed and edified. I mean, it really centers a discourse about the marginalized communities. I mean, that brings up an interesting point, which is that biennials often demand a ton from the visitor. I mean, curators put together something that's like this intricate educational puzzle that you're intended to solve. Like you go into this new world that is uh, totally, you know, mysterious and novel, and you just go from room to room, and you're trying to solve the riddle of what the designers of this universe are intending to impart to you. Before we get into the actual content of the show, what is the vibe? What kind of emotions does it call for? 
There's a lot of video, as I said. I would say that maybe the master genre of the biennial, well, there's a lot of abstract painting, but there's a lot of sort of experimental documentary work, and almost all of them have the same soundtrack, some permutation of the same soundtrack, which is droning violins and occasionally like plucked violin strings, and there'll be a hushed narration, somebody speaking in a library voice. That is the tone of the show. It's reverent. It is asking for you to, you know, sit with it, you know, to steep in atmosphere. I mean, oftentimes curators structure a show in a very deliberate way, almost like a poet structures a poem where the structure is supposed to help the content attain its meaning. A very notable feature of this show is that it's split. Kind of interesting curatorial device so that if you enter on the fifth floor, it's full of sunlight. They've taken out all the walls and the art is sort of hung on these armatures so that you walk through a open plan gallery and sort of around different works of art. And then on the sixth floor, it is very self-consciously the opposite of that, where everything is painted black. A lot of their black box videos here where you sit with very long videos. There's one video you know, that's over two hours long. I really like this contrast. I mean, I think it's a very pleasant installational device. I'm not really into installation criticism of biennials. You know, I think kind of the lowest form of biennial criticism is like the hang was confusing, B minus, that, that kind of review. But I find the fifth floor to be a very pleasant experience of walking freely through this garden of artworks, discovering different things in a way that feels very deliberately open. And up on the sixth floor, it's a much more concentrated experience where you are asked to be still and to sit with ideas, to sit with images. If you're deposited on the top floor, this tenebrous setting, these dark walls, everything is kind of muted. There's this droning sound. There's a room that the curators created that's like right at the heart of this yeah, floor. the mystery room. They call it the antechamber. During the press preview, they were kind of like being very proud, but also reticent to like talk about it too much. It's like this mysterious kind of reverential, you know, almost chapel-like room that they say is supposed to orient the visitor. So what is in this mystery box that they've constructed? This is one of the most enigmatic moments in the show. And I think I'm not going to be able to totally explain it for you. And I think that that's telling. So what it is, is as you say, you enter into a black gallery with a object that's lit under a spotlight. And the object that's lit under a spotlight is a glass vial that, according to a label, and I have no reason to think that the label is lying, it contains the last breath of Thomas Edison, the inventor, which is from the Henry Ford Museum in Michigan. A very famous story about how Henry Ford was friends with Thomas Edison and had someone capture his last breath. So it's this kind of ghoulish, weird object that is a curatorial gesture, as far as I can tell. The curator's acting as an artist to place this object in the room. The soundtrack of the room, um, you'll notice uh, some breathing sounds, some sounds of uh, air moving, maybe helicopters, maybe bodies shifting. And you are in the middle of an audio installation by the very great artist Raven Chacon, which is simply audio recording he took at Standing Rock during the protests of the Dakota Access Pipeline a few years ago, which is of a silent protest where people were facing off with the police. So you have this soundtrack of this momentous political event, and an act of important protest that's happening is completely silent. So you're in the presence of something that makes you think about what historical action looks like. And it's also, incidentally, Chacon's play, who is a very consequential experimental musician. It's his own play on the very famous John Cage artwork, 433, which was just four minutes and 33 seconds of uninterrupted silence of a piano player sitting at the keys, not playing. And it was supposed to make you attune to and listen to 
the audio atmosphere around you, the sound of the room around you, the sound of the cars or people moving outside the space. A very important precedent for this that was all about uh, almost like meditation, mindfulness-like practice of becoming aware of what sound really was. Only Chacon has taken it and the curators have brought it into this space, kind of like centers us. Again, the theme here is time and perception. You have to spend some time. What is important is not always clearly marked out. I think that they're asking you to sit with this show. And the final, I know, I know you want to get this, the final and most enigmatic part of this room that is easy to miss is that high up on the wall opposite the glass vial is a mysterious object that is placed near the ceiling and is very difficult to make out what it is is not mentioned in any of the texts. And I, in fact, wrote the museum earlier today to ask about it. And they sent me a piece of the catalog where the curator says of this object simply, its story is not mine to tell. And I think, again, that it is a symbolic flourish in this show. And I literally am not sure what to make of it except to say that you're being asked to be comfortable with not knowing everything, you know, not getting to the bottom of it and taking that sort of uncertainty and making it part of your experience. So let's talk about the individual artworks in the show. Was there anything that instantly grabbed you as being very important, like the big, important artwork? I think that the artwork, almost certainly, that everyone is going to talk about from this show is this spectacular piece by the well-known Chilean artist Alfredo Yar. It's on the sixth floor. It is an immersive video installation. It actually comes uncomfortably close to me from being something you could describe as a Black Lives Matter immersive installation in the kind of museum of ice cream sense, because it is almost kind of like a ride, to be honest. You go in, you see very vivid black and white footage of police protests in the immediate wake of the killing of George Floyd. It's one of the more, more topical works in the show. And as it unfolds, it's image of a very infamous event in the immediate early days of the uprising in mid-2020 at a protest in Washington, D.C. Helicopters came down and sort of terrorized the protesters by coming so close to them that the wind from the rotors of the helicopters almost like knocked people down or knocked their feet. Jar's big device here is that there are these huge industrial fans planted in the ceiling so that as the action unfolds on the screen, this very intense air comes pressing down on people and people's hair blows around. And it's designed to very viscerally put you back in that moment. My thought about this YAR work is that it's trying to satisfy the hunger for this efficiently delivered, industrial strength, visceral, contemporary art experience that a lot of the rest of the show is trying to cut against with its focus on duration and mystery and atmosphere. That's what makes it stick out. But maybe that's just realistic. Yar has said that he knows that the average audience member's attention span for an artwork is something like three seconds, and that he designed this artwork with that in mind. So were there any artworks in the show that shocked you or that uh, otherwise surprised you? I really am struck by a work by an artist named Jonathan Berger, that is also on the sixth floor. This It's called An Introduction to Nameless Love. That is a room full of metal texts. It's hard to describe it, except it's a kind of a architecture made out of like hand-cut letters that have been assembled into these text fields that kind of function as architecture around you. And each of them is a story about someone who has some very intense experience of non-romantic love. Like one of the texts I was just reading on my way here is about a turtle conservationist and their kind of first encounter with a turtle and how it transformed their life and made them into a leading advocate for 
turtles around the world. I think it's a really interesting theme. I think it's a beautiful and memorable installation. It is a case in the Baeno where I think its mission or the curatorial objective that I take it the curators to have set themselves runs a little up against what the Whitney actually is, which is like a spectacle. You know, it's, but inherently these shows, they process a lot of people who are there to get their money's worth. And this Jonathan Berger work is a sort of chapel-like installation that are only four people are allowed into at once. And so you end up waiting in a really long line. And then once you're in there, if you've waited for 15 minutes or so to get in, you find yourself reading these very detailed, intricate texts and being very aware of the crowd behind you staring at you and waiting for you to finish and get on with it. Fun fact about that piece, one of the artists is actually R.E.M. frontman Michael Stipe. I was unable to figure out in what capacity that is true, but I, 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 his name is among those listed. It's another one of the mysteries of the show, I guess. So was there anything in the show that now that you've gone through it all, what is lingering with you? What's really staying with you? There's a video by Adam Pendleton, which is a video portrait of a woman named Ruby Nell Sales. She's a civil rights activist. And this is, I think, one of the big examples of, yeah, what I'd call lyric documentary in the work. It's actually not so far off of something that could be shown on TV, on Netflix, or wherever. It is essentially a documentary about this woman, her life, um, her influence and impact on people, but it's beautifully done, beautifully shot. And I sat in there and watched all 60 minutes of it and, and saw other people do the same. There is a work by Lucy Raven on the fifth floor, part of her Western series, which I think is one of the better videos. She uses ultra fast camera to capture images of explosions going off behind the camera. So you kind of see a Western desert landscape, and then you slowly see a blast wave cross it. And it's a very simple, but I think very effective work. It's very visceral to me. This show is a little bit older than some other Whitney Biennials. Like there's Often a youth vibe, you know, like trend spotting, seeing what the kids are up to kind of vibe around a Whitney Biennial. This is sort of self-consciously a lot of like figures who've been working longer or even a lot of figures who are no longer with us. And probably the figure in the show that centers the show on that level is Teresa Hack Kyung Cha. There's actually a mini retrospective of her work in this show. She died in 1982 and was... Uh, an artist who was exploring sort of structural film and makes these very mysterious videos that are very 70s to my eye. They're a black and white, grainy film that manipulate images and text in this very spare way. There's a work that I think will probably stay with me as a 10 minute long film that she had that's just permutations of her sister's face for 10 minutes. And at the end, her own face flashes on very quickly. In any case, she's the central figure of this show. And then the idea of celebrating this figure who didn't get very much attention in her lifetime, but has taken on a bigger presence after her very tragic death, I think is important to the show. Again, sort of celebrating figures who didn't get a chance because of the blindnesses of the art world. And her death is a reference in another work of art by an artist named Namira up in the video floor on the 6th, this very mysterious video installation where the artist does, I think, a ritual at the site of Teresa Hak Young Cha's murder. She's a name and a reference point I'll take away from the show. How did she die? She was uh, sexually assaulted and uh, murdered in New York. So there's this very um, mournful feeling to the, the top floor, the tenebrous floor. And then there is the... Um, brighter floor on the floor below that I think, as you mentioned, there's a lot of veteran artists in this biennial, but then there are also some youth quake kind of shock of the new artists. I think one of them that stood out to me was Jackie Connolly. What did this artist's work consist of in the show? So this is an artwork called Descent into Hell. It also struck me. It's four different channels, so it's a little bit difficult to get a full picture of. Like I said, I watched every 
video in this show to the extent I could. I mean, there's artwork in the show that's literally 60 minutes of just words permeating on a screen. So I didn't make it all the way through that one. A lot of art videos, you watch five minutes of them and you think you can probably guess that it just repeats this pattern for the next 40 minutes. Jackie Connolly's is one where I was really proud that I stayed through it all. I think I found it paid off. She remixes characters from Grand Theft Auto, the video game, and sort of takes them out of their context and makes a David Lynch-like film, a kind of dreamlike, almost spirit wandering through the background of a video game. Starting out with a woman in a burning house, and then she moves through this video game landscape where lots of limbo-like strange things happen. And then if you stay around for long enough, it suddenly cuts to an adult film where Emma Watson's face has been spliced onto the actress in it. And you see the video game avatar protagonist sort of staring at this image in a baffled kind of way. And it all adds up to a narrative about how we're all lost in this maze of um, digital simulations and uh, how very surreal and dehumanized and inorganic the world feels right now. It doesn't really add up to a story. It adds up to a feeling. So you've told us about some of the puzzle pieces in the show. What ties all this together? What are the curators doing with this biennial? Look, on one level, I think it's worth saying that biennial art is in the art world sort of the analogy of Oscar films in the film world. That is, it's actually not the blockbuster stuff. The blockbuster equivalents in art would be artists like Takashi Murakami, Damien Hirst, Jeff Koons, artists who are household names, well-known, make spectacular stuff that draws the crowds. That would be your equivalent of your Michael Bay or your Marvel Universe kind of stuff, the stuff that rarely wins awards. But then there is this other category of film, which is meant to be edifying, meant to make you feel like you're a good person, is meant to teach you about a moment in history. And the Oscars and the award shows sort of exist as a promotional device for that category of cultural entertainment. And that's what I feel when I'm in the video. Like, this is a kind of art that is meant to sort of do you the same thing. For a middle class, affluent, educated audience, this is supposed to teach you about the important issues of the world at this moment. That's just maybe a little bit of a dismissive analogy, but I think it's important to say that it has this kind of vibe, that you're here to be a virtuous cultural consumer. And that is an overall vibe of the show. The second thing I'll say I noticed about this show that I think is telling about the overall mission of art right now comes in the wall labels. I'm a little bit over label criticism is like the cheapest shot of all is to talk about how lame the labels of these biennials are. They're always very starchy and overdetermined. And, you know, they're always kind of strong arming you into considering the importance of something. But I do notice a very notable and I think interesting tick of the new genre of wall label in these kind of shows, which is that they always contain the artist's own voice. This didn't used to be the case. The stereotypical wall label would, in a sort of a soft academic way, explain to you the issues invoked by the artist. Now, almost all of the wall labels end with a quote from the artist themselves telling you how the artist themselves thinks about there are, and I was talking to an artist friend about this, and they were saying, like, it's so funny because, like, all an artist really wants to do is be taken seriously and have someone else <laughs> interpret their work. But now the model is that people tell their own story and that the artist themselves is the ultimate arbiter of the meaning of their work. And I think that that's sort of where we are right now is that art is very, very sutured around personal narrative. This biennial feels very careful, very cautious and to a certain extent, full of riddles and mysteries that maybe don't even want to be solved, ultimately. Can I venture my guess for the solution of the riddle? Okay. You know, I studied a lot of poetry in college. You know, what you would do when you're reading a poem is you're always looking for, like, what does this symbolize? What, what does that symbolize? And I kind of was walking through and I felt, okay, so here's this antechamber. We've got this Thomas Edison's Last Breath, uh, we've got this Standing Rock soundtrack, and we've got this mysterious object, which in the press preview, some of the things they said 
made it seem as if this related to the African-American experience. And I got the feeling that this darkened top room is really about the past. It's a meditation on America's past. This room itself is kind of a chapel to the great obscene crimes of America's past and also to some of its um, promise to the technological virtuosity or the technological genius that is uh, really stood for by Edison and also Ford, you know, for all of his flaws. I mean, Ford did fund the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. You know, he's no, he's no saint. Not a great guy, but we all live in a Fordian world of, of automation and, um, and that kind of organization. But then on the brighter lower floor, the walls that are constructed on the top floor to really separate things out are gone. It's totally open. And what you have is this constellation of younger artist voices who are all working together to try to grapple with the problems of the future. And so I saw it as like a past future kind of parable of, uh, of the darkness of the past and the brightness of the terrifying terrifying future ahead of us as as you see in these really dystopian yeah there's videos, a lot of dystopian like, you should say that there's a lot of dystopian stuff in this show past and future that i would say one of the big motifs of the show is um atom bomb clouds like stick around for enough of the videos and you'll get a lot of protests and you'll get a lot of atom bomb clouds and that leaves you with a pretty ominous note i mean reckoning is the big keyword of art right now, and as it is in sort of mainstream cultural consumption in general. The last three or four biennials I've been to, I have had this impression that like the 1619 project, the New York Times special editorial project about the history of white supremacy in America and how foundational it is to our culture and society has been like the master text of these things in an unspoken way. I've just felt like that it is very much that project of reckoning with the past is centers these biennials, is centered on those things in a way that gives them this grieving quality that we're grieving a loss that we can't fix. You know, we can only like memorialize it. That's one way culture is dealing with the challenges of the presence is going into a mode of grieving. The last thing I think maybe I'd say based on your, I think, uh, you're good. Reading of the show as, as a text is that whatever that mysterious object is and whatever it means, I think it might also be a call to be comfortable not having the whole picture. And I just say that because as someone who looks at a lot of biennials, and I know that other people feel this, is they can be very fatiguing. I think that they often get a bad rap in a way. It's easy to dislike a biennial because they're very didactic. They're, by definition, being read as a total claim at the moment they're emerging from, which all interpretations are partial. So everyone's going to have a problem with whatever reading you produce of the present. And they are multitudinous, you know, so there's going to always going to be stuff you don't like in them. And there's certainly stuff that I don't like or falls flat for me in this. Or I feel is a little too biennial-ish. You know, there's definitely a genre of biennial art sort of clunky conceptual things that depend on the wall label in order to invoke their importance. But I have thought a lot recently about sort of freeing my reading of biennials from that interpretation, a burden of having to be a complete interpretation of the present, and to let it be an experience where you can go through it in a kind of choose your own adventure way and find the things that are useful to you within it. And I think that this biennial Having spent some time with it definitely has images, works, objects that are useful to me, that enter into my gallery of images and reference points. So you're a new criticism kind of critic. but And it also it reminds me of that great Ludwig Wittgenstein quote where he says, Whereof one cannot speak, thereof one must be silent. What we cannot speak about, we must pass over in silence. And I think that's a great place to end <laughs> this episode. So thanks again, Ben, for just coming in and discussing this plan with us. Yeah, great. It's great to try and work some of these things out together. Cool. That's it for this week's episode of The Art Angle. If you like what you heard, you can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Also, take a moment to rate and review us. It will help other listeners discover what we're doing. The Art Angle is produced by Sona Manalili, Kim Schneider, and Caroline Goldstein. Thanks for listening, and see you next week.